Hello, guys. Uh, welcome to the next episode of the ATP Weekly. I actually very much, I mean, last year we, ta- we touched on this being like an anniversary of the shows. Uh, I very much remember this episode from Monte Carlo last year because it was that one after Rublev and like everyone was asking, you know, is he going to like break through to, uh, yeah, just a different caliber of a player. I guess similarly, we've got Stefanos Tsitsipas here, you know, wins Monte Carlo for the third time in a row, I mean, not in a row, but for the third time in four years. He's got only three ATP 1000 titles, all of them in Monte Carlo. So is this sort of Stefanos Tsitsipas becoming, let's say, a contender for the rest of the clay season on par with Sinner, Alcaraz, Djokovic? You know, is he, how far away is he from these guys currently after this, this run? Uh, it's, 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 you know, a difficult question, uh, because it's not like we, it's not a new situation. Let's say probably we were not maybe, you know, expecting him to be so good this week, like, uh, like he's been. And at this point, you know, there are also a lot of, um, let's say, question marks about this. Uh, this clay season, some question that we, uh, you know, there's still need for us to answer this question about the top contenders. So I would say that um, for sure, Tsitsipas is one of these players that on on this surface, especially, which, you know, gives him more time to also be more solid about um, what are his, you know, main vulnerabilities about his game. And I would say that he's one of these players that, as it happened the, this week in Monte Carlo, is is here to to you know um, try to to have another chance maybe in the next few tournaments. So far, even in previous seasons, it's been more difficult for him in you know Madrid, Rome, and French Open. He's always been up there, but um, always you know. Uh, face some, I don't know, some Djokovic, some uh, some player that stopped him to, you know, to win the other events on this surface. But yeah, I would say that probably maybe even more in best of three, there can be, um, you know, can be a good chance. I mean, for sure, it's a big step forward for him, considering also he was even out of the top 10. And right now he gets to, you know, number seven. So he gets um, a spot into the, the top eight seats. So maybe even he he can try to to have maybe a more comfortable um, comfortable draw in some, in some of these masters. Let's see what happens because, um, you know, usually Monte Carlo is also the most open one. And it will also depend on which form the other top contenders arrives to, you know, arrive to to Madrid, Rome, and and then the French Open. But for sure, we 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 have understood that we have, you know, had this reminder that Cici Passon Clay is someone for sure that we we have to to look at. Mafi also has uh, put his opinion in the chat here about the third set with Sinner, and I guess that's something we need to talk about that much between Steph and Yannick, um, just, you know, what's what's your opinion on what happened there in terms of, like, how fortunate Tsitsipas was? Because I've seen some takes, even in this chat here on the watch-alongs, people saying that, you know, he still deserves a lot of credit for how he played in the last few games. Me, personally, I mean, for the past hour, hour and a half, he was getting completely dominated, so I'm kind of agreeing with, with Matthew here that... Um, well, even if maybe Sinner, after a couple of minutes, still had some, like a couple of games maybe, where he was trusting the knee again and the movement. Of course, it all like fell apart in the last one. But um, even though, like, you still have to just think that, well, all the momentum was really on his side. And even if maybe maybe Tsitsipas still had to play some solid tennis to get over the line, that was a massive turning point. Yeah, absolutely. Um I mean, it's been for sure. Uh, I would say a lucky situation for for him. That's that's for sure. Because in yeah, especially in the first part of the of the final set, it was very very difficult to you know to 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 see how Tsitsipas could have turned it around. Then we we know how uh, how things went. A couple of things happened. You know, 
that that call uh, for sure, in my opinion, changed the world result because I don't think that Sinner, even with issues, would have lost, you know, six straight games. Maybe, you know, even, um, I don't know, for sure it changed a lot because um, Tsitsipas then uh, found you know, himself with just one break. And so then uh, the physical dip happened uh, for, for Yannick and having only one break to, to recover, it's definitely been... Uh, for sure, a more comfortable situation. Yeah, for sure, he he still Tsitsipas played, um, you know, a, a very good week with a couple of moments. Uh, that second set against Zverev, when he was close, you know, to to find himself in big trouble after having match points to win sixth love in the second, and then that part of the match against Sinner. Mm, yeah, I would say that. Um, this week maybe you know brings him from you know we we had some big question mark about him we can say that he's in that second tier for this clay season that if the you know these top three contenders i would say that cc pass is looking you know um someone that can take advantage of these situations Interesting uh, call there from Matthew. Well, I kind of agree with it. Like, you know, the next time they play, I will still think Sinner has everything he can do. I mean, he has everything he needs to handle at City Pass. Yeah, I mean, as you said, the, the Zverev match was definitely quite crucial for Steph too. I mean, if he lost that second set, that would have been a nightmare. And uh, to me, it just kind of all showed how short on confidence he was, he had been at least. Because, um, well... Um, you get him into that sort of position and you just kind of see that, um, yeah, he just doesn't believe in himself. And that's usually a guy who trusts his game, his personality as well, his mindset quite a lot. But yeah, I mean, months of losing, months of not really showing up in the biggest matches, in the biggest events, uh, they can do that to you. So this is definitely a major for him that to, that he was able to get that title, regardless of how he got there, got there and regardless of how the semi went. I definitely don't think he deserves to be put in that tier one of contenders. Although you mentioned something that they, um, well, it will depend on how good these two top three players are sort of going into the next events. And all of them have some question marks over their heads. We'll probably talk about that soon with, um, well, actually with all of them, with Djokovic, Alcaraz and Sinner. Even Alcaraz who didn't play Monte Carlo, but, you know, Barcelona and stuff, the fact that he withdrew. But uh, we'll get to that. But uh, to me, for now, he definitely does not deserve to be there but after after these the three guys there's like a pretty big gap and i'm comfortable putting Tsitsipas there like ahead of zverev obviously he just beat him and beat him regardless like like let's put that second set away for a moment he beat him pretty comfortably yeah, yeah, yeah. medvedev clay i know he's done some fine work maybe he's gonna defend rome but still uh he can't really be put in the same tier maybe rune if he you know wins munich again and just keeps improving his form. Maybe we'll touch on him later. But yeah, Tsitsipas just kind of seems... And especially after the final, you can't really put Rude on the same level, maybe. Um, yeah, anything else we need to add on Stefan Tsitsipas here? Um, no, honestly, I don't think so. I mean, um, we were mentioning last week, uh, I remember we mentioned Tsitsipas and uh, we we wanted by him, you know, some some reaction given, you know, how Monte Carlo has been successful for him and how we can be more comfortable of the, on the of the clay. And so, yeah, I would say that, uh, yeah, for sure. Regardless of all the circumstances, we we got this answer because we also have to compare, you know, his situation to what it had been, you know, for for months. And so, yeah, I would say that even if maybe not enough to put him in it in that tier one for sure this week it's it's a huge thing and even you know his happiness his celebration showed you know how much uh this discount for him because you know he he seemed kind of lost uh for for a bit you know he wins one of the four big events of the season and is still only eighth in the race so just to underline you know how how poor it's his season had been you know um until this point so for sure a, a good uh, confidence boost and also huge for his ranking and for for sure for the race because right now a new um, a new situation is opening you know in front of him. Yeah, um, I wish Ghosty was here because uh, in that um, 
in, in most of the watch-alongs this week, he was sort of trying to push this idea that Tsitsipas is spraying less on the backhand side, is more consistent, and maybe he's improved it. Which, uh, I mean, it doesn't make any sense because I think the cause and effect relationship is like kind of just, um, you know, um, yeah, he just, he just kind of missed the cause and effect relationship of the fact that playing on clay, he gets more time. And yeah. that's why he's more consistent. And that's why he's... Uh, you know, not pressured to that wing that much. But yeah, obviously this was also a bit of an awakening in that sense that the Tsitsipas backhand on occasion looked very solid, actually, uh, in many of these matches. He just kind of demonstrated. In, in fact, it's pretty funny to me as well, like how different his tennis is on a court like this compared to like very fast hard court. Like mm -hmm. very fast hard court, he just needs to rely on the big serve, big forehand, and really that's it. And here he's like playing, you know, total like inventive, creative baseline tennis. Uh, doesn't really even need to like go for his shots that much. It's it's pretty funny, but but I mean, it makes total sense if you think about it. Um, guys in the chat talking about Evans and Nakashima. I mean, Brandon was a pretty sizable favorite there, you know, probably the better clay player as well. I mean, he's improved yeah. so much over the years. But yeah, um, Evans, even last year, actually, I have to say, he only had like three good events. Otherwise, was losing all the time in the first rounds. So he's kind of hoping for the same this year. Of course, Washington being such a big deal for him, 500 points to defend. Anyway, um, let's talk about Kasper Ruud then. Uh, making the final, um, me, John, and uh, you know all the other guys who were in the story, we kind of had our Ruud awakening there. <laughs> and that's a reference to that uh, wrestling nickname that they give him. But we kind of had our rude awakening in a story in that we started being a lot more sort of, yeah, just, okay, so like if Kasper makes a big run this year, uh, another slam final at Ron Garros, uh, final of the thousand, yeah, that would actually make sense. Like he's good enough, you know, he was really oozing quality in that uh, story run despite losing in the semifinals to a peaking Pedro Martinez. And obviously Monte Carlo was a huge deal for him as well. Semifinals beating Novak Djokovic, the world number one especially beginning of the third set he plays some ballsy yeah. tennis just after being like you know for a set and a half let's say pretty dominated by the Djokovic forehand but the third the final kind of leaves a sour taste right oh yeah for sure uh i mean the, the second set especially my opinion because the, the first set when um everything goes kind of wrong you know it's like okay uh let's leave it a bit but in the beginning of the second set that there, there was you know the chance to try to um to do something and to to take another uh you know to make the match take another direction and there have been moments in where in my opinion it could have doing something something different for example there's been that game where uh, Tsitsipas was for a love up and Casper tried to to stay closer and even if maybe risky because he's not used to it and so I I can can think that it's something that he's not comfortable doing it. but um, he actually got into the game and I feel like that game could have really changed I don't want to say the match in itself because you know, it still can happen that, you know, Tsitsipas then breaks back or something happens, but, you know, still would have given Kasper a huge chance to, uh, you know, to, to, to take the set, even because he was holding his serves more comfortably in that, in that moment. And he tried to stay closer, it, it paid, and then when it had some break points, I... I I don't know, he kind of didn't trust that, uh, you know, that thing too much. Overall, I mean, it's been it's been for sure a positive week. I mean, it's a week that mm, goes very well with his season. You know, he's playing some very good average level tennis, and we want to see if he's able to uh, to take that that step forward. I mean, this has been probably his biggest chance in a big event because uh, you know all. Of course, all the respect to Tsitsipas and especially in Monte Carlo, but, you know, still when you think about a guy that has always played, you know, Djokovic, uh, Nadal and French Open especially, but also, uh, you know, Alcaraz, for example, this was probably his best chance so far in one of these biggest final. Mm, and yeah, didn't take it. So, of course, the, the, the judgment is for sure positive in terms of his path, you know, uh, regarding the season. He's fourth in the race, means that he's doing, you know, incredibly consistent. Uh, 
three finals, of course, uh, reach this year, even if, you know, all lost. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, I'm still, I still think him, you know, for sure he's going to be very tough to beat on the clay this year because what he's showing us is, you know, for sure very, very good. But yeah, yesterday's match wasn't and leaves us a bit like, you know, <laughs> uh, like that. I don't know how to explain. My face probably explained it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. Um, certainly, this was a bit of a wake-up call. You have to check if you may, because like the, the, the next time he plays someone like this in a, in a big final, and it doesn't even need to be Djokovic Nadal. It can be Stefano Tsitsipas. Mm-hmm. How do you kind of trust him? How do you trust that he's going to step up this time if he if he's failed so many times? And obviously, I mean, the, the title over the 250 level, it's never been that big a deal for me because, you know, you have so many finals at the slums. Yeah. You have uh, two finals at the ETP thousands now. Like, you know, it's, it, it's still massive achievements, but clearly there is some issue there. I mean, the first set he played was absolutely awful. And Casper is telling us this year, and we see it sometimes, that like he's trying to be more proactive, he's trying to be more aggressive. I think in both matches, actually, Djokovic Tsitsipas, we saw some uh, backhands down the line that wouldn't be there before for Casper. However, um, I'm pretty sure that like in these two matches, in these two most important matches, and that's including that Djokovic semi, that's when he kind of went back to his former habits. Like, really, for two sets and a half against Djokovic, he was getting just blown off the court by the Novak forehand. Obviously, that was a, another sort of part of that match that Novak just didn't have any intent of grinding and playing long rallies. We'll get to that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just have to be a little disappointed. And uh, basically, I think the big problem is that the next time he gets a final like this, and it's not against... Um, who did he beat this week? Ugo Bear. It's gonna be tough. Uh, it's just gonna be tough for to for me to believe that he will perform if it's a if it's a big final against one of these guys. Uh, you throw in Sinner instead. I don't think it's a match either. So this is a pretty rough one for Casper. At the same time, fantastic season so far. I mean, his his best start to a season. His first Masters Thousand uh, final on clay. His first win over a top three player. His first win over the number one player. So uh, there's so many positives, but I'm pretty sure that like, you know, today, the day after the final, probably in his head, it's still mostly the final performance that will be sort of, yeah, uh, a placeholder. And and that's what he's probably still focusing on. Hopefully with some time, he can manage to uh, just get that away from him and uh, come back stronger. But yeah, uh, if I thought before the final that Rude and Tsitsipas are kind of like in the same tier of contenders for the rest of the clay swing and the French Open, now you can't really argue, like you can't find arguments for that. Kasper just totally showed us that he's actually not, that he doesn't be- belong in that same tier. At least in terms of winning, maybe making a deep run, sure. But at least in terms of winning a big title. Um, anything else to add on on the route? Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, uh, yeah. As I, as I said, I think that we we got the you know classic twenty twenty four Casper Root uh, performance in Monte Carlo. You know, a very good performance, very good run, um, many wins. Uh, especially, you know, a big one over Djokovic, regardless of all the circumstances. Uh, but yeah, uh, then fell it, you know, short. Uh, not even that short in the final, in the end. Um, yeah, feeling is like, you know, he he can do incredibly well, but he needs to uh, perform at 100%, you know, uh, risk maybe any of his forehands. And when you are feeling good, uh, it can go well. Like, for example, I don't know, it happened in that first part of the third set against Djokovic, where, you know, that that stretch made kind of made the difference. Um, in the end, even if he got broken back, but overall, you know, if it didn't take this, these games at the beginning, maybe he wouldn't have won the, the set, of course. But there can be also matches and stretch, you know, where things are, you know, in your game are a bit off. And Tsitsipas seemed like, you know, could have played even at 80 and still do do things quite good enough to, you know, to, to stay in the match. 
Yeah, um, of course. Yeah, if you're if you're trying to play more aggressive, more irreversible common, that's obvious. I'm I'm not really ever like criticizing him for that. But yeah, I just don't I just don't feel like we saw that any of that in like the last two matches. Really, I feel like that was mm. basically him kind of struggling to get out of that comfort zone. And I read yesterday actually someone saying that like Casper's team went kind of for the old strategy of you know just going at that city pass back end with everything and hoping that uh, it's going to bring you some errors. But I don't think it was actually the case. Like, Casper, uh, you know, in the first set, was he actually pressuring that wing in any way? Was he actually doing anything? Definitely not. Second set, neither. I mean, we didn't see any back and to back and rallies, really, for the most part. It was just a very, well, off-putting performance, let's say, for a, for a final and for a chance and well, well a brilliant chance to get one of the best uh, the biggest title of his career because so far he's only played Djokovic yeah. Nadal and Alcaraz in the big finals um speaking yeah, of Novak reply, Djokovic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah just to reply to to this comment i okay. i think that of course i think that of course we can we can agree but indeed we we are not talking here in my opinion about Casper you know deserving a top 10 spot because i feel like you know the way he's playing he's kind of you know um showing yeah, this it. year this this uh, year it's not it's it's not, it's not a discussion this year obviously yeah, exactly. he's been a top 10 player we, we were just talking in my opinion just to reply to matthew about you know the step that uh he he needs to take if he wants to win one of these big matches because uh you know these are the matches where you ha- you need to have that something more if you want to to win and succeed that's it that's that's my take yeah, and I, I totally agree with you, Matthew. I'm just frustrated that these improvements didn't really show up um, mm. other than the back end down the line in these two most important matches. And I'm even taking uh, the Djokovic one into consideration. But anyway, speaking of Novak Djokovic, uh, Kasparov, by the way, is fourth in the ATP race, just to um, just to quickly say that because that's uh, very high. And um, Novak Djokovic, uh, semi-final run here. Again, a bit of a mixed bag, sort of similarly to Root, where, um, you know, it's still one of his better runs this year, I suppose. <laughs> He's only played four events. But there's the physical issues with Alex de Minor. He's, like, breathing heavily after so many points, kind of escapes because de Minor just lets him off the hook. And then in the semis, I mean, that was quite a weird showing in the end because he just comes out, he hits his forehand as aggressively as he last was maybe in 2009, and then, of course, the end, I mean, he, he he loses it. As you said, the first few games of the third set from Kasper were pretty amazing. Then kind of that four or five game, Djokovic doesn't um, handle the pressure that well. But uh, all in all, like, it was just pretty interesting to see Djokovic just completely, like, not trust himself in any longer rallies. Just come out and only he knows what really, like, the intention was, what the idea behind it was. I guess he just probably didn't feel that good physically. But where does that put Novak, you know, going further into the season and going into the other events? I mean, it's still one of his best Monte Carlo performances in in years. Uh, that's right. But I don't know. After the the semi final, I'm. Um, I mean, I I I admit that I didn't watch that set against the Minor. I only heard about you know the physical stuff, but I watched the entire semi final, and um, my feelings are are not that good because. Usually, you also have said that Nova kind of dominated, you know, the game for most of the time. Uh, and how many times it happens that Novak, you know, kind of dominates the, the game and then loses, you know, on the first set, slow start, and then of course it impacts you because then he he plays better in the second half of the first set, but it's still not enough because then Casper was uh, 4-1 up, so he snatches a couple of games and the first set is over. And then do- totally dominates the second set. And I was not expecting him, despite Casper playing very well in the first games of the third set, but I was not expecting Novak to um, you know, find himself again in the situation of Uh, having to come back and then the last game it's been really weird honestly Uh, that ball that it was flying out he makes that that volley double faults on on match point i don't know for sure uh you know the 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 stats let's say are saying us history is saying us that monte carlo has never been a, a a good tournament for him and 
it's actually this one has been the best Monte Carlo run since when he won the title in 2015. So <laughs> it's been a very long time that he was, you know, he got that deep in the Monte Carlo draw. But given how the first part of the season also went, you know, last year it was more like, okay, Monte Carlo is a bad tournament for him, but he won the Australian Open, for example, or something like that. And he was also younger. And then you are like, okay, it's just, you know, bad week. This one hasn't been a bad week because he got to the semis. But, you know, feelings are not different for me than the ones I got when, you know, before the Monte Carlo tournament. So I just will say that I want to, to watch him playing the at least Madrid, and then, you know, I will try to draw any conclusion, you know, going into Rome and French Open, which have been his, let's say, most successful tournaments throughout his, his career on the clay. Yeah, I kind of feel like until we have Ron Garros and if he looks similar there, that's kind of when we can start some, you know, going big picture with this. And perhaps there will be some people thinking Djokovic is done. I mean, there are some people thinking that Djokovic is done, is, is done already, but like, you know, that's just an assumption at this stage. But um, yeah, it's, it's I would definitely be kind of worried if I was a Djokovic fan, for sure. Um, I mean, the, the, just the fact that he was struggling physically so much and um, kind of clearly played like this in the semifinal, you know, was forced to play like this, at least according to him. And um, well... It's it's not really going to be enough at Roland Garros. Uh, still, as you said, Monte Carlo has never been a great indicator in terms of how Djokovic will do in the remainder of the clay season. We know that the focus is slams, Olympics. So it's not like this is the end of the world for him. But if we're sort of, you know, if you're Novak Djokovic and it's middle of April and you haven't had a satisfying event yet, that's kind of not what he's used to. Yeah, the last few years he's been winning like what fifty percent of the <laughs> of the tournaments he enters. So that's uh, that's pretty rough for him for sure. But um, in the end, uh, Matthew, we have a question here: Can we downplay it due to rust and not having a rest day? Something that won't be present around energy. I mean, last year uh, he was also struggling like quite a lot in some matches with like similar things like heavy breathing i don't know third set against alcaraz at wimbledon he had some like minor dips in matches which then he was always able to climb out of it's definitely been something new that he enters the match against Ruth and just starts crushing his forehand you know whatever happens like that's something new um yeah. Well, well, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. I mean, Australian Open, after the cold, he was okay physically. Uh, Indian Wells, I don't think we really got to see much Djokovic there, but he was okay physically, it seemed. Yeah. So So I guess we'll have to, uh, I guess we'll have to see uh, in, in Madrid, Rome. Um, anything else here? Not really. Um, we have like 30 minutes here before um, Eddie will also join us for a 10 minute roundup of the Boost and Challenger. Do you think Duya would have a good chance versus Jari in round two if he wins his first match? Keen always with the, uh, with the good questions. Um, is that Bucharest? No, it's Barcelona, right? Barcelona, he's playing through Haliti. Yeah. Probably not. I mean, against Jari, you got to be super clean. And uh, we know what kind of a head case uh, Duya Dukovic is. And that's uh, pretty tough for him to just stay, yeah, play a composed performance. Anyway, uh, we had Yannick Sinner as well. Uh, of course, there's always this like huge topic this clay season about like how will Yannick Sinner do. Uh, Yannick Sinner sort of never had a proper strong clay court season from start to finish. He's had some big results, yes, like the Monte Carlo semis last year, like the UMAC title uh, quarters at the French. But he's never really had like a you know huge season where every single tournament is really good for him. And I guess we're kind of expecting it now. I mean, he, he did look pretty insane here for the most part, on besides you know, besides getting injured in the third set against Tsitsipas. But is he also under a bit of a question mark regarding his fitness? I mean, basically, you could even argue that the two matches he lost this year, this one more important, like this was more of an aspect in this one. But kind of the two matches he lost this year both had a physical element to them. Yeah, I mean, even if right now, you know, these physical elements are not, you know, appearing so often, uh, they are not really impacting, you know, 
how his season goes or something like that. Uh, here in Monte Carlo, I don't know how much to, to give value to this one because I can also understand that, you know, for players who uh, go that deep in Miami and then there's not that much of time, there, you know, so much time to, um, to adapt, to adjust and also playing this master day by day, you know, right after having had such strong runs, you know, on the hard court in, in March. Cannot be cannot be easy. So overall, I'm satisfied with what I I saw. I feel like you know he he showed that his game, of course, can do perfectly fine. Also on clay, maybe without that um, you know that dominance that he got, for example, in the last two two rounds in in my in Miami against two top opponents like Medvedev and Dimitrov, but. Uh, you know, he still showed us that he he is very very tough to to beat, and um, you know, for me, he always felt like the the better player game wise in all the four matches, and I, so I'm pretty pretty optimistic. Then, of course, you know, probably it can it can change if in he, he won't perform in Madrid, Rome, Paris, but I I feel like in in Monte Carlo he showed that. He his you know adaptation to the clay is going quite well, um, and so for me there's no real reason to to worry and to to think that he won't be be fine in the next clay tournaments. Yeah, I'm pretty much expecting a big run every single event he plays. Madrid should be really good conditions for him. Rome is at home. Yeah, despite uh, it's been kind of the worst one so far for him. <laughs> But I mean, yeah. he faced Felix in 2022. Was not, you know, comfortable. Uh, Felix in Madrid can be can be quite dangerous. So, yeah, I think he's going to be fine this time. Yeah, um, same with with Rome. Um, of course, a home event for him. And also, we have the we have Ron Carlos. Where like, I think by now he's pretty much guaranteed as well to be the second seed for uh, Paris. Which, yeah, well, like... I mean, it might not matter if you have Alcaraz in this in the in the same half. But it's a 50% chance of getting Medvedev as your seed, yeah. which would be pretty amazing uh, for his chances and for Djokovic's chances potentially if he if he's the one getting Medvedev in, in his half. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm expect I'm expecting some strong stuff from Sinner every single tournament in clay. I guess right now, no reason to to think that he. I mean, I, I don't think he's above like you know miles above the field like he was on hard courts. Uh, I still think if if Alcaraz and him play, for example, maybe it would be a slight edge to Carlos, given what he saw in Indian Wells when when there was like a clayish court profile. Mm. Djokovic is a bit of a mystery. Uh, Sinner kind of stands as the one that right now that's definitely healthy, at least going to be healthy. But, you know, the fitness and best of five play, maybe it's going to be questioned. We'll see. Uh, but for now, we kind of have uh, very little info on that. We just kind of know that the two times that he kind that he was tired this time uh, this this year, both times he managed to lose the match. Of course, with this one being like a more prominent aspect of of that loss, the the fact that he well at first had that knee problem and then then just seemed to be uh, I guess fatigued and started cramping or something like that. Um, yeah. Anyway, I guess that's more or less it on Sinner. Uh, we also should uh, right now even... Yeah, I also would say mm -hmm. that right yeah. now, uh, probably, you know, players, for example, also like Sinner, I, I'm kind of feeling that having this, this Masters day by day, it's not something we are used to it anymore, you know? Uh, seeing this player play a match like the one against, against Rune, no, I'm talking about this in general, but um, I don't know, maybe for the fans it's more, um, you know more funny but i don't know if it changed something in the preparation of the matches uh, i feel like for sure you know the physical aspects can become more prominent than in the masters you know that have the, the day off like the the 12 days masters so i would say that um, i think that uh, the two weeks master madrid and rome only increases sinners potential you know given that maybe playing day by day can affect him slightly or you know not in this case slightly but yeah sure it is an argument um someone that we, should, we need to talk about and who was definitely affected of playing you know one day after another was Holger Rune but um Matthew already I think mentioned in the chat 
that he is getting uh, excited about him again. And I guess this run for Runda is like kind of all positives because, well, I know that he played five hours on one, in one day, but after that, he was still able to keep pushing Sinner. Maybe he didn't beat him like in 2023. Um, when maybe like the, the match itself was very different because in 2023, I mean, there was that rain delay, the courts, uh, the balls got wet, the court would got wet, and like you know, he just outgrinded Sinner essentially. Here, he had to try something completely different once again, like sort of similarly to Djokovic in the semis, like probably just tried to be as aggressive as possible because he knew he doesn't really have the legs to go three hours with Sinner again. But uh, it's still a really nice sign, I guess, in, in the very beginning of the clay season for Rune that after the five-hour um, Wednesday or whatever the day was, no, Tuesday, uh, Thursday, he is able to come out onto the court with Sinner and, you know, keep pushing him. Yeah, this is good, um, for sure. Um... But I, I don't know what, uh, you know, for sure it's good from a physical point of view. Uh, that he he was able to to play a, a good match in the following day, you know. Uh, still, I think that he he needs to he needs to to find some some you know other ways. Even for example, the, the match against um, against Nagal, um, for example, could have you know been. Uh, yeah, could have been a bit different story after he comes out, you know, to play and he's up a set and the break and then, and then you know, he still has a lot of, of digs uh, in in his games during his matches. And this is a thing I don't really like, even if he can improve it. Uh, I'm for sure, you know, positive signs for him, that's for sure. But I'm always in this, I don't know if I want to... to to trust him or not, you know, considering, you know, of course, the the, the, the next weeks, I mean, not in talking about his career, uh, because he, he always tends to have this mm, kind of an unmixed balance between aggression and more conservative approach. I don't, sometimes I don't really like the, uh, you know, all-in uh, approach because I feel like he has the quality to not only to get out of the trouble, for example, a lot of drop shots that he he does on the clay. I like it. I like it, but at times I feel like you know he kind of wants to get out of the trouble uh, with all the quality the 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 hands he has um, coming to the net so often. Uh, meanwhile, I think that he can he can still use some aspects of his game a bit better. Uh, then, of course, it was the physical aspect that for sure it mattered a lot in you know especially in the last match but overall i still think that he can uh, he can mature his approach a little bit more and you know and then the quality jump will will come yeah definitely i mean balancing uh, his game out is something that he has been struggling with and um we'll see how he handles it going forward and uh, now it's munich where he's the two time defending champion so Quite an important for uh, event for him in his career, and um, he'll be hoping to pick up the title yet again. Yeah, um, it's a forecast mm -hmm. for Munich, <laughs> and my God, um, it, it is it is awful. Yeah, today so far they haven't started yet. Bucharest and the, the um, Barcelona already underway. The temperature? Uh, um, it, it'll be so, uh, you know. Uh, so cold also the whole week but let's see uh, okay yeah like eight nine ten and the rain basically every day yeah i didn't that's interesting even snow on thursday it shows um and that's an <laughs> atp 500 event next year right yeah that's an atp 500 event next year uh, well we'll see how that goes um anything else from monte carlo that we need to touch on um, yeah, that basically Monte Carlo every year, you know, we we wanted to answer to all, a lot of, you know, our question regarding the clay season. But then at the end of it, if you think about it, how many questions have been answered in Monte Carlo? Not that much, not that many, in my opinion. Uh, because re, re then... Stefan, re Stefano Tsitsipas, some have been. Uh, re Yannick Sinner, Carlos uh, Karas Novak Djokovic, barely any. 
yeah, I mean, especially for these top players, because then, you know, a lot of things happen. Uh, clay season is not that long, but it can feel longer in the end, because then even last year, for example, uh, you had the French Open, and when you thought about what happened in Monte Carlo, it seemed like, you know, an, an, a, an era has, has passed. <laughs> uh, so yeah, in the end, I I always enjoy watching Monte Carlo, but in the end, I I often tend to ask myself, you know, how much I have to to believe to what I have seen, you know, on the court this week. I don't know. I totally get that. Yeah, and yes, Matthew, you're right. Uh, the AFO has ditched Diego Moyano after about four months, maybe. So not the not the most uh, not the longest partnership. Uh, someone we didn't see in Monte Carlo, but we still have to touch on him, I think, is Carlos yeah. Alcaraz, who uh, withdrew from that, withdrew from Barcelona now. I don't know what you're thinking, sir, about all of these news reports. They seem to be suggesting that he's not injured anymore, but he just didn't feel comfortable playing yet, in which case I don't think it's a big deal if he just gets Madrid, Rome and Ran Garros under his belt. Uh, as you said, from Monte Carlo to Ran Garros, it's kind of, you know, it's such a long time that you don't actually need that massive sort of preparation, yeah. I think. Uh, Madrid, Rome and Ran Garros would be perfectly fine. But, um, of course, um, I, I don't know how much we trust all of these news reports as well, you know, and, and whether they actually present the situation as it is. Yeah, it's definitely difficult. I mean, I'm still not really worried about him because, yeah, I feel like um you know if it's you know it's um, a true thing that the injured is is healed and then yeah i totally agree i would say that he doesn't need to uh, to risk you know something again in barcelona given that it's 500 and he also won there the, the past two years so uh, there's not a real reason you know to uh, try to 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 risk uh, some another you know physical physical issue or maybe you know to be back in that um in the issue is you know he is healing and so i would say that i'm still expecting him to 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 be of course uh, you know uh, good enough in madrid rome and french open let's see if maybe the physical issue that he's had this year will make him perform better in rome than in madrid uh, what that in the past years you know it hasn't been the case because 2022 he withdrew 2023 there's uh, there have been the the Marosan match while he he won you know madrid two times so let's see maybe this year can be a bit different madrid some some rust some uh, you know mm, a loss can can happen maybe and then maybe we'll be stronger in rome overall i i don't feel like you know there's a, a court it is way better you know much better than than the other in this case and probably in rome it's a bit more difficult because rome it's maybe a bit easier to play in terms of you know all the field because it's a more you know uh, usual clay court while maybe you know madrid also some of the top players struggle a bit there um so yeah i am still expecting alcaraz to be to be fine once he's going to to heal from from his issue because you know, there's no real real reason. Then if something happens this week, for example, and he's not ready, then not even for Madrid. And then, of course, it it becomes maybe a big deal. But Madrid and Rome are the two biggest, I feel, even, you know, events of the clay season before, of course, the French Open. So if he gets to play both, it's totally fine. Yeah, you could probably uh, sort of go about it like, you know, just one of the thousands and then run Garros. Like, it's it's a possible way oh, yeah. of preparing yourself, but you kind of run the risk of like, what if you lose in the second round? To Fabian Marosan, for example. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't play him in the second round. I think. Oh, no, you actually could. No, why? Never mind. Um, but um, yeah, I love that he makes an appearance, by the way, in every Alcaraz conversation, one way or another, Fabian Marojan <laughs> is always going to be there. Um, yeah, next week coming up, we have three ATP Tour events, 500 in Barcelona, 250 in Bucharest, 250 in Munich. Uh, let's uh, maybe just briefly talk about them as well. Uh, of course, in Barcelona, there's this one big story, which is in the title here, probably because John is in the Dolphin. But uh, yes, not today. However, I think, um, well, I doubt we have the schedule already, but 
very likely, well, it has to be tomorrow because it's a six round event. So tomorrow we're going to have Rafael Nadal playing Flavio Copolni if he indeed plays. Are you like, you know, fully ready for Rafa to play or are you ready for the announcement that, sorry guys, not this time? Um, no, I think that, uh, you know, also considering the way he handled the Monte Carlo situation, I think that if he got there and he, he put himself in the draw, it's because he's, you know, he thinks that he can and will play tomorrow against, against Koboli. So I, I think that if nothing, you know, bad happens, he will step on the court to, to play then what which show we will see tomorrow it's you know maybe a, a, a big question mark but i feel like if he went there and uh, put his name in the draw he should be able to uh, to play it's because he thinks he he will play you know the the event so i'm quite comfortable in thinking that the match tomorrow between koboli and nadal will happen and <sighs> I don't know what to expect, actually, you know, I mm, because uh, for sure, you know, we have this mm, mythologic uh, idea of Nadal on the clay. So, you know, it's difficult for me uh, to imagine Nadal tapping his feet on the clay and not be ready to, to play well. But of course, you know, uh, for sure, his age, his physical issues, a lot of things are on the table. And so, yeah, probably there will be a chance that we won't see. A, of course, I think it's sure that we won't see a perfect version of, of Nadal. Maybe it will be good enough to, to win. Who knows? I think that he is that kind of player who can do a lot of different things to, to get out of the troubles. You know, um, I don't know to what extent trust him, but, you know, I still have this for sure, uh, vision of um, of Nadal on the clay that makes him like, no, I can't believe that he's not going to be at least at a quite decent level, <laughs> you know. Ooh, uh, hard to beat Echeverry, please not, please not. Um, anyway, uh, Matthew says that the world will stop tomorrow when Nadal takes the court all eyes on this man. I felt like that in Australia, you know. But in Australia, it was very different because he was coming mm -hmm. back and we kind of had the info that he was healthy and uh, that was going to be good. And like tomorrow, I kind of am already over that whole saga. Like tomorrow, I just don't yeah. care if Rafa will play. <laughs> Brisbane, yes, I was like very excited for it. I remember we I was doing the watch along with whoever uh, and I was basically, yeah, like, okay, yeah, bring it on. I'm very excited to see how Rafa will look right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just treating it very neutral. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, he's going to play Flavio Coboli, of course. Potentially in his second round, he could face Alex De Minor, which is both tough, but also pretty okay at the same time. In general, Barcelona is not really that strong, I would say, because you don't have Alcaraz, who's been dominating the event. And like the some of the top seeds, you know, we've got Tsitsipas, who always does well here. But he's coming off the Monte Carlo run. We'll see how much energy he has. But, you know, he's made the final in three of his last five appearances in Barcelona, losing to Nadal, Nadal and Alcaraz. Yes. So um, we also have Ruud as the third seed, who's also coming off a uh, deep Monte Carlo run. And we don't really know how much energy he'll have. We also have Andrei Rublev as the second seed. And like recently, Andrei Rublev has been kind of uncharacteristically mm -hmm. losing matches left and right. Yeah. And uh, it's just very hard to point out any real favorite for Barcelona anymore. Of course, that's not really what we're used to from that event as four years. It used to be Rafa, 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 Rafa. And right now we also started that Alcaraz domination era, but now he's not there. Yeah, right. It's it's difficult, you know, mm, what to expect, uh, let's say like this. I probably would still su suggest that the, the two players that are coming from... Uh, Monte Carlo can can have a very good shot. I would mm, think that they should be, you know, uh, fine to to be well because I don't know. Tsitsipas has always done 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 well there. Uh, and Casper, I don't know the way he's playing this year makes me quite comfortable in thinking that he should have mm, another solid week. And so I would say that these two are looking are looking well in my opinion, despite having played, you know. Uh, a long week in in Monte Carlo, 
Uh, Rublev, yeah, I think that it will be, you know, he needs to 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 answer some questions because we were used to uh, another version of Andrei Rublev, let's say, you know, even despite not getting over the, the line uh, often, but it was still that guy who was very tough to beat, you know, uh, winning still a lot of a lot of matches let's say more or less what rude is being this year you know winning a lot of matches in more or less all these events that maybe you know losing a lot of um, quarterfinal semi-final and maybe at times even in the final you know against the the top opponents and right now it's been definitely rough for him after the dubai um incident let's say you know indian wells uh, yeah Miami, Monte Carlo, he won only one match. And also, the three losses have also been uh, quite, you know, bad for him. You know, never really uh, looked looked himself on the court. Monte Carlo, always a place, you know, he finds comfortable in playing because, of course, the title is here. Also, the final in 2021, you know, overall, he plays very well there. So yeah, I I was expecting him to to find back his level maybe in Monte Carlo after a rough sunshine double. I was like, okay, maybe it was you know uh, a bad stretch and it will end on the clay now uh, because I know he is usually a very solid player on the surface. I mean, he still has time to uh, to try to to improve his performances, but for sure it's a bit. Mm, were right considering you know which which version of ruble we have always you know seen over the past four five four five years then i mean even you know canada cincinnati last year was very bad and then in the end he he went back to but it was different they were very close matches i don't know how to explain the feeling i'm getting is very bad right now all right. Um, we also have the two two fifties. One of them in Munich, of course, an event that we've kind of gotten used to, and it's actually going to be a five hundred so next year. So the last event, the last time, it's a two fifty at least for now. Um, lots of like two time champions in Zverev and Rune as the top two seats, which you know two two time champions, but still, of course, Rune winning the last two editions. Uh, that's basically the main two favorites we have to say. The last two years, actually, we had the final between Rune and Botik van der Zandsburg in this one. And yeah. unfortunately, this year we won't be getting that. And that's not because Botik van der Zandsburg won't get to the final, which is also tr true, but you know, that's not even because of that. But this time they can meet in the semifinals. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, this event, of course, as, as Mario already pointed out, has some real issues regarding the weather <laughs> coming up. So we'll see how uh, that progresses. It might be Houston from last year <laughs> or something like that. But yeah, Rune Zverev probably remained the, the main favorites to take the title, even if Sasha maybe hasn't won that many matches in it since the, these titles that he picked up in 2017-18. Yeah, he, he hasn't played that well lately here. I mean, 2020 was two. Yeah, he got Rune. I mean, that then got to, to, to win the title. Overall, he's not playing that well lately there. But yeah, they are, of course, the two main favorites. There are also a lot of, for sure, good players in, in the draw too. But, you know, considering the, the condition, they should be the, the two big favorites. Yeah, last year, uh, Fritz played a decent tournament there, but he also played well in Monte Carlo. He was in a different state, so maybe this year it's a bit more difficult to to, to trust, you know, his performances in in Munich this year. But um, yeah, I would say that uh, these two are looking, you know, quite solid. Even you know, for for what we we saw, I mean. From from Zverev, for example, the match against Sisi Pass was was not great, but still he should have you know that level to to beat you know the 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 lower ranked opposition. If not for you know he what happened last year, for example, you know Zverev has a very bad day and the opponents uh, plays well. Let's see how he will perform because last year he he has never done very well there. Probably Rune a bit more favorite, considering that he won the the last two uh, two years this tournament. Let's see, but yeah, overall pretty pretty even, you know, the the two halves. Yeah, um, 
uh, Keen says that he likes Rebek's chances versus Mikkelsen. Mikkelsen still yet to... Well, he won two clay court matches like on red clay before, but I think the best opponent he faced was Otegi in these matches. So mm-hmm. I, I get that. Although Rebek last year, when I remember that match with Fuchovic, uh, yeah, let's forget about it. Um, he had too much points, but it was one of the worst matches I've ever seen on the AP <laughs> tour, really. Um, but of course, you know, Rebek is kind of an indoor specialist, so it's fine. And uh, we also just will briefly touch on Bucharest, I guess. It's an event coming back after six years. It's going to be on next year's schedule as well for now taking the place of Estoril, but maybe they will work something out. Uh, I guess it's the weakest one this week by quite a lot, but we still have plenty to look forward to. I mean, Fonseca with another wild card. Uh, I'm kind of stunned at some of the qualifier spots that we can get because I'm just looking at it right now, just thinking sort of, you know, what if Vashro qualifies, for example. And one of the qualifiers you can draw is Kovacevic, who I don't think has won a red clay match ever. And also uh, you have... Um, uh, Kokinakis was kind of flying over from Sarasota. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, quite a few opportunities there. Darderina Vona yet again. Right now, I've been watching Sabre. Yeah, I mean, in, in the end, this well. makes it, for me, quite a fun event to, to look at because, yeah. you know, the fact that also there are not like top 10 players or something like that, for me, it, it makes it quite fun. Uh, you know, there are some some players that can, can make a deep run. There will be a lot of, I'm expecting a lot of good battles uh on on the clay so yeah i would say that each it should be a fine event actually i'm looking at the draw yeah borges vavrinka round one i didn't yeah, expect exactly. that earlier that's quite that's quite fun too uh of course anytime we see fonseca on tour right now it's super fun too and um yeah let's see how that goes um no really like no 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 points talking about the favorites i think because yeah it's yeah. very very open maybe yeah i'm looking at it and i'm like i don't really know talon Sport if he was in his form from last year although in the clay swing he actually wasn't that yeah uh, maybe that fantastic he wins between darderi and navone can have a very good shot given you know they're playing well this year let's see France rundolo waking up it's very possible too yeah uh, everything but, can yeah. happen in the end yeah Almost. I'm pretty sure uh, Alexander Kovacevic won't win the title, but sorry, Kova, if you're watching this, I'm, I'm really sorry, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you won't. <laughs> anyway, um, I guess that's going to be it then, right? I mean, we've talked about Barcelona, Bucharest, Munich. Uh, we've mentioned all the most important storylines from Monte Carlo. As we mentioned, Eddie is going to come on to talk about Busan uh, for a couple of minutes. Hello, Eddie. Hi, Damien. How's it going? Uh, was it your first time in Busan? Second time in Busan, I went once uh, two years ago during the quarterfinals. But yeah, first time to spend so much time there. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how was uh, how was it from the sort of media side? You know, covering it for for the channel here. Yeah, it was pretty nice and interesting for me. Um, uh, other than like you know the usual ATP media team and so on, like they're I guess they're not used to having a, a, like uh, foreign media come in. So yeah. It was uh, me and, uh, yeah, I was the only one there. So, I mean, that was nice in a way, though. And they were pretty uh, accommodating to me, like, let me do what I wanted with some of the interviews. So um, so I got to speak to some of the players one-on-one, and that was nice. Yasutaka Uchiyama claiming the title, first one in since 2019. That must have been pretty big for him. And then sort of, yeah, especially after the last few tough seasons, now he's like, you know, fully guaranteed into like the next couple of slams. Uh, still a very fun player to watch live, right? Must be. Yeah, I felt it was nice actually to see him. Because I, I mean, obviously I've seen him play before, but to see him up close, it was, you get a different perspective. Yeah, how, how he was taking the ball very early and he was playing well and like just hitting his spots using the angles well and especially in that yeah against duckworth and um and in the final as well he 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 was really tough to to play against he was yeah coming into the net well and yeah making it very difficult for his opponents so yeah it was a big week for him he talked about how yeah like he said he struggled with his physicality but he feels like now at the moment he's actually coming back into uh you know he's been he's been pretty good recently so he said that he's always felt good like technique technique wise at the at the challenger level he's always felt like capable of winning um 
these events even in the last few years but it's just that you know his physic uh, physicality has been an issue but um yeah big moment for him to get the title first in five years and then he's going to go back to tokyo for a week and then continue on the on the, the asian swing in, in china so yeah it's been yeah, for you, probably uh, one of the bigger stories of how we actually didn't get to see that much was the, the Hong Kong semi-final, right? The, the bo both guys who are, well, who are going to join the military at the end of the season. So uh, mm. it's a pretty similar story, I guess, for both of them. Uh, from what I've seen on your Twitter, maybe, or maybe on the channel, I guess Quan still has one more shot if he makes it with that PR. But yeah, but I, mean, I, I guess both right now, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's obviously he's planning for for the army and and i think they, they've made the decision because i don't think they actually have to go right at the end of this year if they if they like i think they could wait a bit longer but i think they've probably made the decision together um but not not much longer right because they have to go until they're like 28 or something like yeah that. yeah so maybe they could delay it like another season but yeah i think they've just yeah made the decision to to go at the end of this year and yeah there's a small chance if he if he was to miraculously win a bronze medal um at least a bronze on clay at roland garros i mean we, we don't really expect that to happen so yeah but i mean if you were him you would go for it anyway wouldn't you wouldn't you but uh yeah but uh yeah it's, uh, yeah it was a bit of a shame for hong because um yeah he was really hoping to win this uh title at home i mean yeah he, i guess yeah, there's only one more chance to win a title at home and now in Guangzhou before he has to go. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's a shame I couldn't get to see that that match. But um, the, the the other semi final though was good. Um, Duckworth against uh, uh, Uchiyama. So yeah, it wasn't too bad in the end. Do you think some of how well Hong has played this year? I mean, the free challenger finals. Do you think some of that is just kind of pressure being a bit off because he has to join the army because his career will go on hold anyway? It might be partly that he did say, like, I mean, he's just you know because it is his last year. He is just trying to enjoy like playing his tennis this year. And but I also do think yeah, it's maybe partly because he's he's got used to playing at this level and also. I felt like uh, he's got physically very fit. Like I felt like because he's not like he's quite limited and his he doesn't have much strength, right? But his his weapon is his is his wheels, right? So um, he's got he's really quick around the court and he looked physically fit from from what I could see. And uh, I think yeah, he, he doesn't have much upper body strength, but you know he, he's 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 working. You know he doesn't give up so um yeah i think it's he's he's getting as much out of his game as he can really get right now and yeah it's it's he's getting reward so yeah was there anyone from like maybe sort of you know not one of the semi-finalists uh, any player that like really impressed you this week despite maybe like not going that far in the actual event um I would say, well, I, I mean, I, I saw some of um, uh, what's it, uh, Colin Wong's match. Yeah. So, yeah, there was moments where he was uh, playing ridiculously high level, extremely aggressive tennis. But I felt that was the match against Hong in the quarterfinals, but he couldn't quite uh, keep it up. I felt like both players were really up for that match. And, um, I think probably for for Coleman, it was like playing on his mind, like the previous match that they played at the Asian Games, because they played each other in the quarterfinals, and Hong won that match. Um, yeah, but um, in terms of like other players that that uh, that didn't didn't progress to the final, I mean, I thought I thought actually uh, Paul Job, from what I saw of him, looked good this time. Um, I know he's had his issue with injuries and also uh lloyd harris as well i thought um he looked pretty solid and he was he was hitting well so hadn't seen them much for a while to be honest but uh yeah i, I felt like it's going to be interesting to see how they do now in guangzhou um i noticed that harris and job are in the little section there of the draw 
So um, I think they might be fighting to to try and get further this week in in Guangzhou. But uh, yeah. Are you planning any more um, trips in the Asian swing? Um, I'm probably not going to go down to Guangzhou, uh, but nor the rest of this challenger swing. But maybe yeah, later in the autumn when we get the the ATP events coming around, and and I'm not sure of what the challenger uh, schedule will be like then. But who knows? Maybe maybe some challenger events. But I, I don't think there's going to be any more Korean challenger events in the autumn. Mm. So uh, only because I saw the like Korean Korean Tennis Association's own like schedule and it didn't there weren't any like events on. And I don't know if that's maybe because like this year the WTA five hundred is being upgraded to a uh, sorry, it used to be a two fifty, but now it's been upgraded to a five hundred this year. And so we but we've got no sole challenger this year. I don't know if there's some uh relation there and uh, funding or something like this but i um yeah it doesn't seem like there's going to be an event in seoul this year which is uh other than the wta so that's a bit of a shame but um yeah yeah i think last year last year in the autumn i don't think there was any challenger either right in uh, south korea at least no no they were all in the usual sp spring right but uh yeah usually we usually get the seoul and then Guangzhou and then Busan, but this year just no Seoul event. Um, I think, um, yeah, I'll probably try. I'll probably attend the 500 event. It comes at a good time here because it also is at the same time as a holiday. And then um, possibly, I haven't decided yet. Maybe Tokyo, but let's see. <laughs> so the right, and if, if someone wants to follow tennis in Asia. Uh, yeah. They have a good account on Twitter, right? <laughs> on that. <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, that's my Twitter handle, Tennis Asia. You can find me there. Oh, one thing I wanted to talk about actually as well that um, amazingly they were apparently Mario and Super Tennis. They show all the challengers one two fives or many challenger one two five events, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The channel uh, here um, it has happened. Uh, you know the the issue with with sky because we we had um until last year we had basically almost all the the atp tour event um and wta on the the public channel and you know um this year they they have not the rights anymore because sky bought them and so they now they are showing a lot of challenger events totally totally free you know uh, on on our public TV channel about tennis so basically you just have to to turn the TV on and it's also one of the first you know channels so it's easy even uh, to find it and you know we can have access to a lot of this you know challenger action I know that maybe who likes uh, you know challenger tennis can can find it of course on challenger TV and it's still free mm. but you know it's for sure very nice because it can I don't know. For example, um, I remember that when this channel uh, was, you know, so so small uh, when I was, you know, uh, a, a small kid when I was eight, nine. I remember that I got into tennis because I was watching the Trofeo Bonfiglio, which is a, a, an important junior event uh, that they play in Italy. And so, who knows? Maybe someone else like me watching these challenger events free, you know, <laughs> some challenger match can can be uh, get passionate about tennis. And yeah, it's it's very fine for me. Not maybe not for the channel because having the main tour is for sure, you know, uh, m much bigger, of course, of a deal. But this is what it is, and they are still doing a good job. They were also in Barletta, where I went um, to the Challenger, which is very very close to my to my home. They were there also with cameras doing interviews and something, which is something new because they, uh, you know, I I wasn't used to see you know television broadcaster in Barletta really doing that many interviews, also on court interviews or something like that. So mm. can be also a good thing, but yeah, overall I'm pretty disappointing really because you know 
them having the the, the main tour uh, you know free on the channel was um, very big deal for all the country in my opinion so contrastive feeling about that right okay yeah because i just was became aware of it when uh just a little interaction on twitter with one of the commentators who was actually covering the busan challenger this mm. week in italy for super tennis alessandro ferrari uh, so yeah, yeah he, he was he was he was covering it they were covering it since the first round which is actually yeah, yeah more yeah. than more than is shown on tv here because they only showed like the semis and the final here so yeah um yeah, I just thought that was interesting because, you know, ch Challenger coverage is generally limited in, in a lot of countries. If, you know, to get it on TV at all, is, is, is a good thing, I guess, <laughs> especially <laughs> with commentary. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so yeah, that was just what, what was, um, what, what, yeah, I was interested in. But uh, yeah, it was uh, an interesting week and, and, and um, I got to speak to, a few players like uh <laughs> yeah Quan and uh Quan Sinbu and Coleman Wong and uh uh yeah Uchiyama and uh, I was supposed to speak to uh Lloyd Harris but for some reason he didn't turn up but uh yeah I don't know miscommunication or something yeah but um it was interesting uh speaking to to Coleman um he came across really well uh like a like a nice uh young young guy but um and also very ambitious he said he wants to reach the next gen finals this year and also uh, well long term he said he'd like to be a grand slam champion and number one in the world but <laughs> i mean yeah i've heard players uh, say this before so um we'll see what happens but i mean i don't think the getting aiming for the top 100 or next gen is, is so out of the question so i think it's a reasonable sure. thing currently he's yeah. be if we just stopped here i mean he would be qualified for the next gen uh, right exactly. a lot of that a lot of that is because they changed the rules this year right and uh you only get players 24 20 uh, and 24. under yeah, yeah 2004 born and 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 then later yeah pretty much so so you you basically have to skip all of the I don't know well Medvedevich maybe this year hasn't amassed any points but like there are a fair few players like Nardi Petri Pericard who would be higher than him Dam but actually not that many anyway uh, so yeah I mean he's got a great chance to to hit the next gen finals currently in number seven in that ranking after Menchik, Fields, Shang, Mikkelsen, Van Asch, and Fonseca. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah d one top one hundred as well maybe is is possible but we'll, he's gonna have to keep progressing in these challenges the next few few weeks i think he's got a reasonable draw actually in in guangzhou so um we'll see how that goes i think i agree with that i i, I was doing a the, my challenger show this morning and i think i picked him to win the title because for fun i just i just pick uh the title winners and uh, i did like his draw quite a lot indeed in, in Bangu, yeah so. i think he's got a good draw and then like you you would thought like maybe Bertanen might have been a threat, but we we saw that he was quite poor last week and he struggles outside for some reason. And yeah. that's precisely yeah. why why I thought Wong has a good draw, yeah, because Otto first needs to get there to that quarter and yeah, just be in the yeah. right mindset, which uh, isn't really happening for him a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, thank you, Eddie, for uh, sharing this perspective with us. Thank you for the content on the channel. If you guys are interested in any of these uh, interviews that Eddie mentioned, uh, they are um, going to be on the on the Talking Tennis channel as well. In fact, they already are. Yeah. Uchiyama, Hong, uh, Wong, and, and etc. And um, yeah, hopefully to, to more uh, challenger visits, to more uh, ATP, <laughs> WTA visits, and to... Yeah, uh, once again, thank you for everyone as well who was listening to both parts, the ATP weekly show and this additional segment that we added on Busan. Actually, John, is you're there. Uh, who is the Jakub Bobro player of the week? And is it someone from Busan? Uh, I don't know if he hears me now. He, I, I can see him, but oh, maybe now he does. Because we didn't announce that. Or, is it a woman this, this time? Or? I think I think so. I'll just do it separately. Okay. All right. Uh, never mind then. Uh, have fun in Stuttgart. Uh, John's in Stuttgart, if uh, someone doesn't know. So expect a lot of content from uh, that as well. And uh, thank you, Mario. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, thank thank you. you to all the thank guests. You, in the chat. Thank you. We'll be wrapping up.
Thanks, guys. Um, Thanks.